Welcome to Infant Mental Health Promotions video series, Infant Mental Health from the Bench. I'm Cheryl Jackson. At the beginning of each video module, we'll present a continuous drama of a family going through different stages of a divorce. Following the dramatizations, we'll have roundtable discussions with experts who will share their insights. In Module 1, the Smiths are giving their respective briefs in front of a family court judge to determine custody and access of their three children. Your Honor, he only cares about himself. He doesn't give a damn about my children. All he does is play video games, smoke, and drink with his buddies when he's home, which isn't often. I can't believe what I'm hearing, Your Honor. All I ever see her do is Facebook. She's always trying to start a fight in a hope to turn the children against me. Sure, I work late on occasion, but when I do come home, dinner is still not ready. In fact, I can't recall the last time she cooked for those kids. They're always eating chocolate bars, never anything healthy. Go find yourself somewhere in the kitchen. Stop bugging me. Can you see I'm busy? He has no idea, Your Honor. When I cook, he's never even home. And when he's left alone to take care of the kids, he's not cooking. It's our daughter. What kind of parent does that? Hey, no, we have plenty of eating now. All right, go. What I've heard here today, I cannot come to any decision. I will require further assessment. Has Council any recommendations to offer at this time? Uh, we do, Your Honor. The parties have agreed to a nesting arrangement and as well to have the children undergo an assessment. Very well then, agreed. We will adjourn and reconvene in one month's time. Thank you. Our panel is here to share their insights on what we've just seen. We're going to begin by talking about brain development, stress, and epigenetics. And joining me are Jean Clinton, June Maresca, Andrea Moen, Judy Cameron, and Brenda Packard. Judy, why is early brain development so critical? You're born with almost all the brain cells you'll ever have. And cells connect to each other. That's what they're genetically programmed to do. Early in life, lots of areas of the brain are connecting. But then as a child grows and gets older, you have fewer connections. And the real key is which connections stay and which connections get pruned away, which is the term the neuroscientists use for that. The ones that get used the most stay. So early development is when children are using their brains and governing what connections stay and what connections go. So how is that impacted then by persistent conflict in a child's home? Persistent conflict distracts the child from doing things that they might otherwise be doing. So let's say you have a very young child who's learning how to focus their attention on an adult and read emotions and expressions. If there's a lot of conflict and the child is distressed and doesn't know what's going on, they won't spend as much time learning to evaluate emotions and expressions, and they won't be as good at it. All right, Jean, what about in a situation where there is high conflict in a child's home uh, between the parents? What impact would that have on a child? 
a very intense and negative impact on the child. We know, as Dr. Cameron has said, that the brain is built by the experience. And in particular, in the early years, it's the relationships that the infant has with their caregivers that uh, builds, uh, builds those connections. So we know from science that even when babies are sleeping and parents are arguing, when those kids have been studied in the, in the machines, their brains are acting differently if they're living in a high conflict situation. So we now are seeing the impact of high conflict even when children aren't experiencing it directly. What does that do? As Dr. Cameron has said, the stress pathway, the way that you deal with conflict later in life, the learning pathway, all of those are being wired in the earliest years. And if the energy is being sucked up by paying attention, is this dangerous? Do I have to, do I have to listen here? Then other areas of the brain are not going to have the same access to learning. So toxic stress, that's unbuffered stress, high conflict, major impact on, on uh, children's brains, even when they're sleeping. When you're in a relationship with a caregiver that's warm, responsive, we would call it psychologically minded maybe, but when you have someone who is able to soothe you, help you deal with that stress, then um, that, stress is, uh, that stress is less. Judy, when kids are exposed to conflict uh, on, a, on a regular basis, constantly, how does that influence gene expression? It'll change gene expression. Every time a brain cell fires, it not only sends a message, but it expresses genes. Many people think that you're born with the genes you have. How can you change genes? Turns out you are born with your genes, but only some of your genes are regulating the function of cells. The genes that are expressed are doing the regulation. So if you change which genes you're reading, then you're going to have different signals being conveyed in that cell. So stressful life experiences are going to change which genes are utilized by that brain cell and are directing the function of that area of the brain. There are multiple ways then that you're getting effects of stress on the brain. You're changing connections, you're changing gene expression, you're changing the secretion of hormones that regulate stress responses. And you're changing how the child sees the world. And so what gets activated when the child is looking at the world changes. Are those lifetime changes? They are lifetime changes and they have a very long-term impact. If you look at the child's mental health or physical health, when they're much older, 50, 60 years old, there's a big impact of early life experiences on function. Can you describe some of that? Yes, there's been some very good work called the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, or ACE study. And what you see is that children that have had a lot of adversity early in life have a higher probability of having mental health problems like depression. They have a higher probability of addictive disorders. They have a higher probability of diseases that we don't even think have to do with the brain. So they are more likely to be obese, have diabetes, have heart attacks. Early adversity has an effect on how the brain and the body operate, and that's sustained throughout the life. We've been talking about consistent conflict in the home. Um, Jean, I'm wondering what happens when the conflict, how do you determine whether it's consistent or not, and how important is that? In infants, uh, they're not talking yet. So oftentimes judges ask, well, how will I know that this infant is being affected by the, uh, by the constant or even episodic uh, conflict? And so how infants express themselves, their, you know, their physiology, eating, sleeping, um, learning how to crawl, they're the things that get interrupted. So a baby who becomes apathetic, not responding as well to uh, facial uh, cues, becoming more irritable, 
um, a failure to thrive, meaning not 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 even not even growing, um, and and just I have seen infants who really are depressed. They are just so withdrawn. So even before the development of language, um, uh, the body, these things get embedded, as Dr. Cameron is saying, and they remember, not necessarily with words, but it gets embedded in there. Andrea, how might a judge use this information to inform uh, decisions that they have to make or case conferences? Especially decisions judges have to make. We have to be very careful about what we bring into the courtroom. Um, because normally we are only supposed to pay attention to what we hear in the courtroom and uh, and that would include experts. The difficulty is in family law, I think in most courts across the country, we don't have experts that come in to tell us these things. So from my perspective, it's really important that we learn about these things so that we can apply them. Um, in the court that I deal with, it's custody and access and uh, um, of, of warring parents. It's usually serious custody access because they can't make decisions themselves. And so when I go and hear these cases or do case management, I bear in mind the things that I have heard and learned about the brain when I'm thinking about how the children, where the children are gonna live and, and what circumstances they're gonna live under. So this has been important information for me as a judge. June? Yeah, I would agree that um, I think that education of judges uh, is, is critical in this. We need to understand how babies, infants, toddlers um, react in situations of high conflict so that we can address those kinds of things in our decision making and in the orders that, uh, that we impose. Um, I think one of the problems, though, that uh, I see in our system is that it's a very adversarial system. And so the high stress that these infants and toddlers are experiencing in the home sort of gets translated when their parents come to court. And their parents are now in a situation of high stress, high conflict. It's an adversarial system. And so one of the things I think judges have to be mindful of as well is how that gets carried back in and of itself to whatever happens and whatever orders we make um, in the final analysis. So I think as judges we need to think a lot about what kind of atmosphere we create in our courtrooms in terms of problem solving for parents and what kind of orders we impose at the end of the day and how that stress and conflict is going to be translated through those orders back into the home, which is a real problem. Andrea, how can judges get the information they need? I'm going to come at this slightly differently because all judges who are appointed to the bench come with their own set of knowledge and their own what could be called prejudices, but I use the word very broadly, but their own way of looking at the world. So when we go to our judges' courses and learn about things like this, it, um, it can help to displace some of those attitudes and things that we come with. But when it comes down to the actual courtroom itself, uh, how we think about what a family should be doing has a very, very big impact on the, uh, the, the orders that we make. But we can ask the parties, if they're a counsel, we can ask them to go and get information about this and come back and talk to us. Um, we can ask questions ourselves, but, but learning about these things does have an impact on how we look at cases, I believe. Judy? I think something that really needs to be remembered is the, the child having a receptive, attentive adult who cares about them is what's important. And if it isn't going to be the parents, if they're in the midst of conflict, having another adult that provides that will be very valuable to this child and help buffer the stress. And so children can be placed in daycare or placed in preschool in a situation where there will be a caring adult and that will very significantly buffer the situation going on in the home. One of the judges, Cheryl, just adding to Judy, um, when I presented to judges in Alberta, um, uh, I say that every child should have one adult whose eyes light up when they enter the room uh, and she came up to me after and said, that is now going to be one of my orders, that you must find at least one adult whose eyes light up for this baby, or a little one. Thank you.